begin to find your seats this evening. Sing that song, Freedom. Oh, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is peace. There is peace. for freedom you set us free it is for freedom you set us free and I'm free I'm free I'm free I'm free where the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom and where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom there is peace there is love there is joy as we stand it is for freedom it is for Freedom, you set us free. It is for freedom, you set us free. Let's sing that song, Overcome. Oh, seated above the throne in the Father's love. Seated above, throned in the Father's love. Destined to die. Poured out for all mankind. God's only Son. God's only Son. Perfect and spotless one. And he never sinned, but suffered as if he'd. All authority. All authority. Victory is yours, Savior. See it, I'm saying, Savior, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all of our praise. You overcame, Jesus. Awesome in power forever. Awesome and great is your name. You overcame with power in hand. With power in hand, speaking the Father's plan. You're sending us out light in this broken all authority all authority every victory is yours Savior worthy of honor and glory worthy all of our praise you overcame Jesus 
Jesus, awesome and power forever, awesome and great is your name. You overcame and we will overcome, and we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Everyone overcome, we will overcome, and we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Everyone over, sing it one more time. We God together, Alleluia, Yada Bacare, Bibi, Bibi, Yada Bacare, Bibi, 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 God, I love and bless you, Lord God, I thank you for your goodness, Hallelujah, Lord God, Yada Bacare, Bibi, 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 thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, amen. Pastor Tom Phillippe, open our service in prayer. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Amen. Thank you. I want to thank every man that uh, came out and took the time to be with us here tonight at our, the last men's discipleship of the season. And so I appreciate you coming and being with us. Uh, we'll now break for the summer and uh, focus on evangelism during the summer months. And then uh, in September, we'll start the season, men's discipleship season again. Then our next event, of course, is uh, conference coming upon us in July, July 8 through 12, and that'll be coming up here just around the corner. But tonight we have an honor having Pastor Mark Olson. They just finished a great conference in Tempe, and uh, also they announced their uh, new building they're going to be purchasing. And so he is uh, filled with the glory cloud uh, in addition to anointing, and he's going to come. He's a great man of God uh, doing a great work. Let's welcome Pastor Olson while he comes. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. What a privilege it is. Uh, I love this setting. I love to uh, be able to preach to men and to uh, cause some trouble. Uh, what a, uh, an incredible time on my timeline uh, this July 27th will mark my 50th birthday in Christ and uh, and just I uh, I'm very um, uh, just like pastor said there's a um, there's an intense uh, cloud of uh, wonder and awe and excitement uh, as to what God has in store for us. Let me tell you something. Uh, God has chapters in every one of our lives. Um, not every chapter is the same. I wish I could say every single chapter has been just, you know, living on top of the mountain of glory and transfiguration. But you know what? Uh, on balance, uh, you 
cannot lose with the stuff we use. And I tell uh, men, wherever I get a chance to preach, I said, you know, the only way we lose is if we quit. And you know what? Uh, let's, you know, there's power in making up your mind. There's nothing as powerful as a man of faith that has a real relationship with Jesus Christ that locks in his mind and thereby his will is engaged, uh, his spirit that begins to tap into the power and the supernatural of God. There's nothing as powerful as a man that is surrendered to God and sold out uh, to do God's will. I think it was D.L. Moody that uh, he heard something to the effect that the world has yet to see uh, what would happen if, if a man was 100% sold out for, for, for Jesus Christ. And D.L. Moody was reported to have said, let me be that man. Uh, you know what? Uh, there's something very, very powerful that takes place uh, when we uh, make up our mind, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Let that man think he shall, let not that man think he will receive anything, not a zip. Uh, God loves us to settle uh, the question or the issue. We're going to serve God. We're going to put our hand to the plow. Uh, God, uh, you know what? Here am I. Uh, Lord, send Joe Campbell. No, no, that's a joke, a long, sick joke that I've uh, told with Pastor Joe Campbell. But no, uh, here am I, uh, send me. Did I get anybody to say amen? And so uh, uh, I want to minister out of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In order to be saved, you have to know Jesus as Savior. And we can correspond uh, these different categories to what happened with Israel. Israel is God's storybook uh, where we get to see in flesh and blood how things work out. So Egypt was the place that God saved his people from. It's a type of the world and Pharaoh is a type of the devil. And then you have to know Jesus as shepherd if you're going to stay saved. 40 years in the wilderness, uh, Jesus' main revelation to the people of God was that he was their shepherd and guided them, led them, and uh, the glory cloud moved, and, and they had to get in sync with the rhythms of God, and faithful, faithfully the Lord shepherded them through but if they're going to enter into the promised land, there is a new facet that you must know and you must uh, you begin to work with about our Lord, and that is as soldier. Right on the very brink, uh, before they were crossed over, uh, Joshua was reconnoitering the promised land, and, um, and he's checking it out, and all of a sudden he is confronted by this person uh, that's very intense and this man has a sword that is drawn out and I want you to understand this is not a sword that is an ornamental sword uh, this was not a sword to just pick his teeth and and uh, just uh, just for show but this was a sword uh, that was going to uh, be drenched in blood and uh, and when Joshua was stunned by him and, uh, you know, began to react a little bit defensive and said, who are you? Are you for us or for our adversaries? And uh, the response back was very, very interesting. And you need to, you need to do some one-on-one -on -one with this uh, scripture. He said, neither, uh, but I have come as the captain of the hosts of heaven. I am the general of the armies of heaven. This is what we call a Christophany or a theophany, a pre-Bethlehem manifestation of Jesus Christ. And this sword is in a striking pose. This is a, uh, this is a manifestation of God 
that Joshua needed to know if he was to uh, be successful in this new endeavor to go into the promised land. Uh, I want to talk about some promised land that God has for each one of us, and I want to look at um, uh, striking down the strongholds, and again, with the, with the aim towards possessing the promises, possessing your promised land, and we're going to focus on uh, something in just a moment. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, the old King James for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or human, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high uh, thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So my sermon's title is Striking Down Strongholds. And I want to look first at the battleground, which is the mind. Any general, any strategist understands and there is always a prime piece of real estate uh, that is crucial to the outcome of war. Any great general, Napoleon and Alexander, they, uh, in their writings, they were known to say that if they could get the right piece of property, and, and many times it uh, had a bit of elevation, if they could uh, secure uh, the right piece on the uh, battlefield, um, they would have the advantage that they would be able to uh, very quickly subdue their, uh, their foes. In the Philippines, um, uh, while I was there from 1986 to 1995, we experienced five coup attempts from renegade uh, uh, generals and sometimes colonels were involved. Um, and I noticed um, that each time that they launched a coup attempt, they always sought to take Malacanang, the palace, be our uh, equivalent of the White House, they tried to seize, and several times they were successful, uh, the international airport and get control of the TV stations and, and the newspapers because they understood something, that if they could control those strategic places, um, then it would be very easy for them to project an image that they were in control and that there was no use to resist. What's the use? There's already... Uh, it's all the battle's already lost and they would begin to churn their propaganda anytime there's really a war there's uh, a facet of that war uh, is the propaganda mill that churns out the information that you want to project to your enemy uh, concerning what your status is or your position or your strongholds and and so really what we're talking about is it's crucial to gain the upper hand. And you have to subdue um, uh, certain um, uh, objectives. And, and from those um, strongholds, um, then very easily you can begin to subdue uh, the areas um, uh, in ever-widening circles. We have a, an old saying from discipleship, and that saying is, the devil does not kick a dead dog. You know, we have a uh, uh, statement in Revelations 12 that the devil is, is depicted as the accuser of the brethren and that he accuses them day and night uh, before the throne of God. We could put that in, 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 in modern terminology, night and day, 24-7, the devil is there and somehow... Uh, he is jabbering, he's berating, he's uh, dogging, uh, pointing the finger, criticizing, mocking. Uh, and so the devil is not wasting his time. In other words, what he gives himself to uh, uh, gives us a tremendous insight. These are the key focal points um, of the spiritual battle uh, to gain the upper hand. Clearly, the devil tonight has an objective. Um, we find this from the very beginning, what he did to our first parents. He singled out Eve first, and that of itself um, uh, tells us some interesting things. If you think about Eve being more of the emotional side uh, and, and more governed by uh, her emotions, and what the devil did 
as he, um, uh, as he hid behind the serpent, he beguiled her mind. And so he wormed his way or he put, projected some kind of a mental fog that began to engulf her mental faculties of sight and sound and, and, uh, and uh, feelings and so forth. And he gained a foothold um, in her thought processes. And, and once he secured that, it was just a matter of a short period of time, he could accomplish his goal, which was to get them to fall. This is why the Apostle Paul speaks in Ephesians chapter 4, and he says, give no place to the devil. That is the word in the Greek, tapos. And it literally means a place, a location, a room or quarter, a place where someone can move in and set up shop and I remember Pastor Mitchell used to say, don't give the devil a landing pad in your mind. What he does is he tries to get a foothold uh, where he can um, have what's called in real estate ingress and egress. If, he, if you have land and it's landlocked around, uh, they have to grant you a passageway in and out, ingress and egress. Um, and this is the objective of hell. If I can just get, uh, worm my way in and get a foothold, then I can begin to set up shop and I can begin very rapidly to send out sorties and, and, and parties to war and conquer more uh, territory. You know, the tried and true uh, plan or strategy of hell is the battlefield is the mind. There's a European proverb, and it goes like this. Age and treachery will always defeat youth and zeal. I mean, you know, the devil's been at the game for a long time. He is a master psychologist. He knows how to push and to manipulate buttons. And can I say as somebody that, you know, when I tell you that I've been saved 50 years, Please, do not think I'm trying to say, hey, I'm a heavy, I know everything. I don't know everything, but I do know some things. And one thing I do know is there's buttons in each one of you that can be pushed. And I'll also add, while I'm at it, there are buttons in you you haven't had pushed yet, but the devil knows. And he's waiting. And he's gathering up his... his um, timing and so forth um, and uh, and he'll um, uh, he'll push those buttons at the appropriate time and so uh, he uh, has a strategy he is an ancient he is a treacherous foe and so this is the opponent that we're up against and and on the other hand on the uh, the Christian side of the equation many times we're dealing with people that are quite I find quite idealistic and quite untested, but very confident in their, in their presumptions. You say, what do you mean? Well, let me give you exhibit A. How about Peter? Hey, you're all, listen, tonight's going to be an intense night. You need to watch and pray because this is going to be like uh, next level and something heavy is coming down. I need you. I need you to watch and pray with me. Uh, you know what? Uh, you're all going to be offended, and it's going to be intense. Peter, nope, not, not I. You've got you've to you think about uh, how Peter, uh, if, if you make it really real, uh, and Peter is announcing uh, his uh, overconfidence, very, very, uh, you know, very boldly. Everybody else, can you imagine? You're on the out outreach team. It's the Deadly 12. And one of you uh, pops up and says, you're all a bunch of losers, but not me. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, you're all a bunch of slugs, but I'm the one that's faithful to Jesus. There'd be 11 guys that would start to intercede for his fall. <laughs> but just take it on the face of it. So... Everybody else, though, everybody else will deny you, not I, and um, I'll go to the death for you. So he is, 
uh, demonstrating incredible naivete in, in the sense that he's sincere, but he is sincerely wrong. He is sincere. I don't doubt that. We saw that, you know, don't picture Peter as a yellow-bellied chicken. He was ready to wield the sword. He, you know, I think he had stashed a secret switchblade. And uh, when the dude comes to grab Jesus, he was ready to fight. He was, but he didn't understand the nature of the battle is, is spiritual. No, put the sword up. They that take the sword will perish by the sword. This is not how we bring the kingdom of God to pass. This is not how we advance the kingdom of God. It's not in your brawn. It's not in, your, uh, in uh, the, 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 the courage of your own uh, flesh or your own, uh, you know what, you've been, you've been working out at the gym, so now you're a bad boy and you can, you know, you can punch some people down. Uh, no, this is going to be a spiritual uh, clash and a spiritual uh, 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 intense uh, war that's going uh, to unfold on you of which you have not tasted yet. While I've been with you, I've shielded you, I've given you covering them, but you know what? I'm going to be taken from you, and the devil is going to have an opportunity to take some crack shots, uh, shots at you. Uh, you have not experienced yet. And you know, how many of you know that when Jesus tells us to watch and pray, we better keep some oil in our lamp of prayer? Uh, how many of you know it's not a good idea to contradict Jesus Christ? When he tells us uh, that we could all uh, be offended and all flee, and then we uh, say, no, Lord, uh, everybody else except for me. But, you know, uh, Peter found out rather uh, quickly and, um, and uh, very, uh, very um, uh, soon was he to, uh, uh, to discover his own, uh, his own weakness and his own uh, flaws. And so uh, we need to understand something. Uh, most Christians and many ministers, in fact, they, uh, they have a, a notion of their own spiritual strength or their own, uh, their own zeal uh, that can be uh, quickly clouded when the devil begins to unleash the big guns and begins to uh, press his attack and there's a satanic attack and then the clouds begin to roll in and then there's frustration, discouragement mixed in the uh, in the, in the uh, lethal brew, and then there's um, uh, some compromise that begins to creep in, and, and then what we have now are some strongholds um, uh, that hell has constructed. Um, and, um, and, so, uh, and so this is, um, uh, these are issues that we have to allow the Spirit of God to speak. And just as Jesus was there with Joshua on that day, uh, he didn't come to play patty cakes uh, with uh, Joshua. He came uh, and he shocked Joshua. He, he didn't come to tell jokes and just to slap back slap. And uh, he came uh, all business. And, and so tonight, the Spirit of God may choose to visit you in that capacity. You know, we love uh, a Savior. We love the comfort of a, of a shepherd. But when Jesus shows up on the uh, on the battlefield of our life as a soldier and particularly as the warrior general, uh, that can sometimes be unsettling and, and can shock us and put us back on our, on our heels. This isn't, this isn't a side of Jesus that we're the most comfortable with. In other words, he may have to confront us. He may have to uh, uh, put his hand on some spots in our life uh, that are um, uh, that are uncomfortable for us to uh, to see, and you know when the heat comes on, uh, that's oftentimes when demonic forces um, are manifested, um, uh, as we see with the Apostle Paul. There's just a good uh, typology in Scripture. Paul is uh, marooned on the uh, island of Malta, and uh, they're cold. There's been a storm, so he picks up some sticks, and and when he puts those sticks on the fire. Out comes a viper, and uh, it uh, what 
he didn't see the viper. It was hidden in that mass of sticks and that bundle of sticks. And it was only when the heat came that flushed out that hiding viper and attached itself to him. And it was the heat that came on that viper that caused it to strike the apostle Paul. And thank God that there was some supernatural power of God to help deliver him so he didn't die. Now, I want you to think about the faculty of the mind. I believe it was the Beatles that sang that song. What goes on in your mind? That wasn't the Rolling Stones, was it? No, it was the Beatles. What goes on in your mind? And that's a good question to to really ask because there could be a world of difference as to what really is going on in your mind as opposed to what people see on the outside. But I want to tell you, we can be professional actors. We can uh, arrange ourselves to be um, uh, good Christian uh, men as we come to discipleship class. We can parade around. But what's in your heart eventually is going to bleed out. And uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Proverbs 4, 23, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And then Proverbs 23, 7 says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So basically, what occupies, um, uh, what occupies and speaks into the inner man through thoughts is going to color, it's going to influence in large measure, it's going to either motivate us to good things and righteous things for God, uh, victorious things for God, or it's going to begin to taint and pollute and, and, um, and it's going to um, uh, cause us to, uh, to divert from the um, will of God. And this is why uh, every one of us in this day that is bombarded by mental pollution, by mental uh, junk food, uh, I don't want to go on a big tirade about all the garbage that we can access on the internet, but just the spirit of the age, um, uh, it is toxic, um, and the only chance we stand um, is to allow the word of God to richly dwell in us as the apostle Paul exhorted us. That means a daily intake of the word of God. You know what? It's, um, it is uh, tragic that guys can know all kinds of sports um, uh, statistics. They can quote sports statistics. The guys can know what's going on in the, um, you know, in the um, political realm. We've got political junkies that can, you know, tell us this and that cons- conspiracy, and and it could be true. It may not be true. But the point is, um, is all of the things of the world um, have a, a tainting um, and uh, a defiling to it. Um, the word of God is is as depicted in in Ephesians, the washing of the water of the word. Peter, uh, again, we appreciate Peter for his bluntness. Uh, and uh, when Jesus was going to wash their feet, uh, Peter says, uh, not my feet. And then Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And then, of course, Peter wants a full shower. But the issue is, is that in those days they had sandals, open sandals. They walked along the uh, road and he times the road is dirt Uh, it is uh, decorated with metal muffins cow patties horse patties uh, and they come into the house they they recline their feet are up uh, pretty close um, at least uh, within the uh, schnozola's uh, range um, and um, and so it would be a good thing uh, to have people wash their feet for hygiene and for uh, just for good manners at dinner time. But the point that Jesus was making is that with your feet, you contact the, uh, the dirt of the world and you can be washed by the blood of your soul and your, and, your, and your spiritual life is saved by the grace of God. But there's a practical cleansing uh, that must be done. And Jesus said, if you don't let me do this, 
you, you're not going to, you're not going to make it. You're not going to last. And so thank God we have uh, men that preach the word of God from the pulpit. But if that's all your, if that is all your intake is the few sermons that you get during the week and uh, you're not going to, you're not going to excel and you're not going to have um, the victory in your mind that God intends for you to have. My good friend uh, Kevin Foley and I were discussing how powerful the Word of God is, and, and he made a comment. He said sometimes when he's traveling overseas and he's on the road and flying and stuff, and, and he's had some times where uh, he's missed uh, his daily discipline of being able to take the Word of God. He said it's like something is lost, and, and my mind is just it just is under. Uh, it's just vulnerable to all kinds of, uh, of fiery arrows and, and uh, assaults. Whereas if you're disciplined, and he was making the point that when he has his regular uh, daily session with the Word of God, it puts like a force field around his mind that promotes um, uh, good hygiene, it's mental hygiene, that promotes good uh, health and wholesomeness um, of the mind. And so I encourage you, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, saturate yourself on a daily basis. Uh, we encourage people to have a, a, a Bible reading plan. Some people have the, it's the lucky dip uh, finger method. They just open their Bible and they dip in and it's like, Lord, speak to me. And they put their finger and, and Judas went and hung himself. And, oh, no, that, no, that can't be. And so then they, and then they, Lord, now speak to me. And I, Lord, whatever you tell me from your word, I will do. And then they do the second time. They open it to that spot and it says, and go thou and do us likewise. <laughs> so don't mock God. You know, you've been given a mind and, and you've been given the ability to have some logic and some, uh, some um, you know, order. And so I would encourage you to have a plan. Some people just, you know, gravitate to their favorite part in the, in the Bible. And, uh, but there's some, there's some, you know, every single book that's in there, even the um, uh, genealogies, they're put there by divine inspiration. And, and so, again, you may not, uh, as you read that scripture, you may not say, oh, I got a powerful revelation by this guy begat that guy and he begat this one and that one. But you know what? I'm telling you, it's the word of God. The word of God, uh, heaven and earth are going to pass away. My word shall never pass away. The word of God projects a spirit. The words Jesus spoke to us, they are spirit and they are life. And so even when you're interacting, interfacing with the gene genealogies, um, there is a spirit from God that is tapping in your spiritual being. And, and there's another level than just simply your consciousness. The spirit of God is uh, touching. The spirit of God probably is doing some reformatting you don't even know about. And so I encourage you greatly if you're going to have um, uh, a healthy mind uh, to have a daily intake of the uh, word of God. You know what, Tim, as God's word does a, uh, a readout, it's like a radar that, uh, or an x-ray that goes across and, uh, and he begins to uh, manifest um, uh, strongholds. Let me talk to you a little bit about a stronghold. And there's a telltale sign. The Bible uses this uh, word, imaginations. These high imaginations and, and these things are what the devil parlays and into forts or fortifications, strongholds. And, and so this word imagination literally uh, is uh, what we get in the English, computations, figuratively reasoning and, uh, and speaking in the context of those reasonings that are hostile to the Christian faith. Uh, the word is also uh, preceded by high things, these high imaginations, and, and this in the Greek is an elevated thing, um, an elevated structure, something that is a barrier, something that is a rampart um, or a bulwark, um, something that uh, is, uh, is, is um, established in the mind that takes root or puts down uh, tentacles in the mind uh, that defies or contradicts the lordship of Jesus Christ. Uh, in other words, um, you can, uh, in, in 
most, uh, uh, for most uh, part, you could be a, an agreement about um, the word of God and, and the things of teaching, uh, but all of a sudden, uh, uh, as the word of God is, is um, being preached, the word of God is being read, or the word of God is being meditated on, it comes to a spot and there's some, there's some kind of a there's some kind of a tension, and uh, there's a uh, there's some resistance in your mind. It might be on uh, something like tithing. It might be on something like uh, uh, work. It might be on you know some kind of aspect of ministry or submission or something that men have problems with. Um, and there is a reverberation inside. That would be a good indicator um, uh, that the spirit of God is is. Um, running into resistance, and, and that's possibly a, a stronghold that's there. Any place uh, uh, in your mind that has, uh, that has a sense of no hope, you know, the demonic strongholds um, oftentimes are uh, 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 accompanied um, with a sense of despair, a sense of depression, uh, a crippling uh, area that has been triggered or a monument um, uh, that uh, flashes out where there is depression or unbelief and um, and this is a can be very overwhelming this speaks about a stronghold that has been erected that defies the kingship of Jesus Christ you know what Anytime you have something that begins to come on you and start to overwhelm you that says, what's the sense? What's the use of this? You know what? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't feel like this is going to be a good scene for me. I don't feel like this is going to uh, you know, pay off in my life. Uh, why am I doing this? Going to church. Uh, faithful and prayer and all this stuff um, and all of these things um, and then this mocking spirit of unbelief begins to creep in I would say that God is putting his finger on a stronghold uh, that's there anytime there's a heaviness of spiritual oppression remember we're talking about Satan's kingdom which is darkness and so I want to consider a few uh, very particular strongholds one stronghold um, is deception Anytime the devil can get you to believe a lie, whatever it is, and this gives him an ability to capture and to hold in bondage. Jesus warned us. That's all I need uh, to get me to, to, to be cautious. Jesus warned us in the last days, false teaching and uh, teachers um, would be an epidemic. Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Matthew 24, 11, Many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Peter spoke um, and warns us about controlling spirits. In 2 Peter 2, in verse 18, for when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, and while they promise, verse 19, they promise them liberty, uh, they themselves are slaves of corruption. By whom a person is overcome, by him also is he brought into um, bondage. So this is a picture of someone being caught and held in a snare. They have taken some bait somehow, some way. They have entertained something. They have, um, uh, they have taken a hold of that. And now that has been given the opportunity to put down uh, some roots and, and a snare or even a trap that's been sprung. Uh, and uh, that person now is being caught in the vice grip of deception. His mind begins to be warped somehow. And uh, there's a... Um, uh, there's a um, Blanket that begins a cold uh, blanket to suffocate faith and hope and the love of God. And, and so these are belief systems that some of you, while I'm speaking tonight, you have, uh, you have a measure of this or some perhaps even in a dominant way. You're, you're functioning uh, on, and, and some cylinders are hidden, but some other cylinders are gummed up because deception um, has, um, uh, has tricked you. Could be some traditions that you've been brought up with. Could be some things that you were taught in school. You know, uh, I don't take cheap shots against the college uh, education, but 
We've got some real doozies teaching school. I went in with my daughter. She was at ASU, and this guy uh, was a teacher. And uh, he was just, uh, uh, you know, a big class. And so he began to use some uh, profanity in his, uh, in his uh, discussions and, and interactions with the students and offended my daughter. So I said, well, ask him for a meeting, and let's go in and talk to him. And so we went in, and I genuinely just wanted to tell him, hey, is, what, where is the purpose of those profane things? My daughter happens to be a Christian. I let my daughter talk. By the way, when we sat down, he's, he looks, and he says, who are you? I said, well, I happen to be Jackie's father. He said, I don't have to talk to you. I go, and that's a nice way to get off the... <laughs> <laughs> May the bird of paradise fly up your nose, too. <laughs> We're going to have uh, a warm, fuzzy relationship, I can tell. And so, but you know what? God helped me to kind of hold my mud, and, uh, and I, I, you know, the, thing, the tension was reduced a bit. But this guy just had a really, really odd, odd spirit. And so, you know, my daughter made a stand for her faith, and uh, they worked out a situation. Actually, she began to have some private tutoring because the guy made a lame thing. Well, you have to relate to young people. And I said, no, you don't have to use profanity to relate to young people. It's out of place. It's not, it's not part of the curriculum. And, and so anyway, the guy was lame. And so, uh, and so my daughter worked it out. She, she uh, you know, you stand for Jesus Christ. You're going to take some hits of, uh, of uh, ridicule. But you know what? You probably, if you make a stand for Jesus, you can, uh, God will help you. So helped my daughter and she graduated. But she comes back to me. She said, hey, dad, you remember that guy, that professor? And I said, oh, yeah, of course I remember him. Uh, he was bald and he had one of these little, uh, little, you know, little tassels of, you know. And I was so tempted to just... Uh, but uh, that was the old Mark. And so, uh, and so uh, she says, you'll never guess what, what this guy's up to now. I said, you know, I don't know. Oh, he had a sex change, and now he's a, he's a, he's a, sh he's a shimmy, or he's a hemi that became a shimmy. Or, or This is a whacked-out generation, right? And so, uh, and so the point is... Um, is that um, we need to be, uh, you know, if you're going to go to college, you need to be uh, very, uh, very determined uh, that you're not going to be corrupted by all, and they, and they are going to try to corrupt you, and they are going to uh, target you once they find out you're a Christian with ridicule and so forth. But, you know, here's the point. Matthew 24, 12, because iniquity or lawlessness shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And so uh, this is a, uh, the spirit of the age. Another stronghold that's very prominent, and it's very prominent at this time of year, is the stronghold of desire. And I would just touch on lust. You know, we all know the tragic, I've just been reading Samson in my daily reading. Samson was a he-man with a she-weakness. Samson was a man that could kill a lion, but he could not resist honey. <laughs> honey? He killed the lion, but he couldn't resist the honey. Let me tell you this. Every man has gunpowder inside of him. Every woman that's not right is a match. Are you listening? Don't be a dumb ox. I could have said a dumb donkey, but I didn't want to cuss in here. Don't. You know what? Uh, it's just uh, uh, so sad to see people that have strength. Um, Samson was the strongest man. Uh, Solomon was the wisest man. David had a heart after God. You could say that David was the most spiritual, the most spiritual, the strongest, the smartest. All of them were no match for lust. 
lust always gets its man or its woman if, uh, if the guard is dropped um, and uh, there's nobody uh, that can, um, uh, oh, I just have such an iron will. I can, I, I, I'm so, I am so strong. I can go and I can um, uh, I can go into a whorehouse and uh, and just intercede and pray in that place. No, you idiot! You're going to uh, you know I've seen things over the years of people and their cockamamie stories. And you're not stronger than lust. Lust has taken many a man and many a woman down. This is a time of year where the heat comes on and the women dress um, uh, improperly and very uh, inappropriately. And so that means, like Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes. You know what? Um, uh, Women that wear low-cut clothes, um, uh, they bend over, uh, even in church. um, You know, you need to have a a spiritual shelf that that activates. And so when they're bending over and they're dropping their, uh, you know, their bumps, uh, uh, you need to be able to look up and appreciate God's creation outside or something. (laughs) Because the look, then the thought, the fire, and things begin to uh, uh, get uh, out of of order. And so this can become a stronghold. Um, And can we talk for a minute, Uh, you know what, in this day where pornography is just so easily accessible, we can tell you it's wrong, we can tell you to put every guard and everything, and still uh, we'll have people that have an extra, they have a secret phone, or they have a secret iPad, or they go to the library and and I can't even imagine going down to the public library and porning out and perving out at the library. But, but uh, stranger things happen. And by the way, I just got to throw this out. There was a guy in Cebu. Uh, he fasted three days. My brother, uh, Pastor Dave Stevenson, uh, I believe it was, it, the guy was in Cebu. And, uh, and, and he fasted three days. And then I, when he broke his fast, he went out and fornicated. Oh, he, he ate food and he's ready, he's ready, to, he fasted three days, but when he got food in his belly, uh, uh, his animal passions came back on with a vengeance. So you know what, uh, the Bible tells us that Joseph uh, ran from uh, fornication. He didn't crawl away, uh, you've perhaps seen it, uh, you know, most, most people, the Bible says flee fornication, put your Nikes on. Hit it in the high gear, get out of there. Uh, most people don't flee it. They crawl away and pray, catch me if you can. And uh, God tells us uh, that you uh, need to, uh, you know what, when, when push comes to shove, uh, get out of there, turn it off. Uh, you know, I, I tell you this, um, that God uh, absolutely can give you the victory. There's some guys here tonight. Uh, you've been uh, in and out of pornography, uh, and uh, unless, unless some strongholds are taken out, uh, you're going to go back to that habit because the urges of life. You know, one, I would say if you're single, uh, especially if you're from Tempe, get a wife. <laughs> Better to marry than burn. But even men that are married, that doesn't mean that you're exempt uh, or immune from lust. And so, uh, and so we're going to have to let God help us with this issue. We're going to have to judge this issue. And, you know, that's where uh, that I close with this is the power of God is available. We are given weapons to dismantle, to demolish the strongholds, and, and first off is the blood of Jesus Christ that um, legally, judicially takes care of uh, uh, the stain and the demonic uh, rights that hell wants to uh, claim against us. The blood answers the legal question. The blood 
pays the price. The blood enables us um, uh, not to be judged, not to go to hell. We can be washed whiter than the snow. Um, uh, but you know what? Then there's the practical steps um, of avoiding it and, um, and, uh, and, um, uh, and again, arming your mind, um, arming your will um, with the strength that comes from intermeddling with the Word of God and, uh, and the blood of Jesus Christ is the first. Uh, but praise be to God um, uh, that uh, repentance um, uh, that God, I'm judging, I'm identifying. If you have some area in your mind uh, that catches uh, depression, catches fear, is, uh, is uh, an area of laziness uh, that all of us probably are as lazy as we dare to be. I believe the first sin was not Eve, by the way. I believe the first sin was um, Adam was lazy. God told Adam to take stewardship and dominion, take dominion, subdue the garden. The Bible says um, where there's a breach in the hedge, uh, you shall be bit by a serpent. Uh, and so somehow there came a serpent that came in uh, through some kind of a breach um, in the outer uh, wall of that, uh, of that uh, hedge around the garden and uh, was able to worm its way into the center of that garden and able to talk to the woman. I believe that uh, Adam was asleep at the wheel and, and uh, because of sins of omission, uh, they lead and they oftentimes uh, uh, give rise to sins of commission. If you are walking in the spirit and you're doing spiritual things, it's impossible for you to walk in the flesh at the same time. If you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're involved in the, in the church, you're involved in ministry, you're involved in a call of God and you have a vision, uh, you fill your life with spiritual things, um, you know what? Um, you won't have time uh, uh, to um, uh, be pouring out at 2 a.m. in the morning. You know what? You should be sleeping. Amen. And so I uh, just give you that uh, encouragement that repentance um, and humbling ourselves uh, uh, draws the Spirit of God to us. And the uh, Bible tells us, uh, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he shall lift you up. When you humble yourself to God, Lord, I need help. I confess my need. I confess my faults. I judge my sin. I hate my sin. If you're here and you're making excuses, I'm weak. I'm just, I was born this way. I'm, I'm having, uh, you know, it's just this way I am. Uh, my family, I've had people tell me, uh, don't you understand, Pastor Olson? Um, they'll tell me they're Italian. Don't you know that Italians have hot blood? No, I don't know that. I believe that everybody here has probably an average of 98.6 blood. That means if you're Irish, if you're German, if you're Mexican, if you're uh, African, it doesn't matter where you go f come from. Uh, uh, we all have to uh, deal with the issues of life. Uh, and so don't make some excuse because of your genetics. And uh, you need to be honest before God and judge the issue. Uh, and if you do that and humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, uh, God will pick you up. By the way, if you're somewhere's out in the, in the, in the live stream land, uh, you know what? Prodigal son, come to yourself. Come back to your right mind. Uh, the prodigal son came to his right mind. And he said, you know what? This is insane what I'm doing. What's going on in the world? Jesus Christ is coming back. Uh, it's time to come back to the Father's house. Um, and if you'll do that, um, if you'll just simply get back up, come back to God's will that has an address for your life, uh, it's the only place in the entire Bible that depicts God running. Everything else that God does deliberate, methodical. He's not in a hurry. He never makes haste. Uh, and uh, and but the one time that God is depicted as running uh, is uh, this uh, this very poignant scene. The father sees the prodigal son coming home, uh, and he runs um, uh, to embrace him and to help him. And that's the uh, promise of God here tonight. If you're a prodigal, let's bow your, our heads in the presence of God uh, in this place. The strongholds, I hope that you would be helped. If there is a stronghold of fear, you're afraid to rise up and afraid to present yourself and surrender. That is a stronghold. 
It can be like a ball and chain. Maybe you have a stronghold of laziness and procrastinations. Always a loser's limp. Here we go, another loser's limp. I would, I would have, I would have served God, but you know, I've got this problem. Well, God uses imperfect people, imperfect vessels that he pours his spirit out and he transforms them. The glory of the gospel is not what we are, but what we can become. That's a great Pastor Mitchellism. The glory of the gospel is it's not just what you are right now, but it's what you can become when you surrender to Jesus. Can I tell you something, brother? Jesus only works for what he's put in charge of. From the first miracle in Cana of Galilee in the, in the wedding, Mary tried to manipulate him a bit or, or tried to use some you know, parental pressure. Jesus, they have no wine. And Jesus said, what have I to do with you, woman? My hour has not come. Mary immediately recognized her error and she shifted her approach. She understood. I'm not going to have a lever on, on, on Jesus. I'm not going to be able to manipulate him, even though she was his mother. And she shifted and she said to the servants, whatsoever he says, do it. And that's when the miracle was triggered. God only works for what he's put in charge of. You're here tonight. There's some people here you're not ready to go to heaven. If the rapture happened, be honest. You're not ready to go in the rapture. And God is dealing with you. I've kind of like shot buckshot on different issues, different things I've touched on. The Spirit of God takes those things and he is faithful. The Holy Spirit comes to convict of sin, of righteousness, and coming judgment. None of those things are pleasant of themselves. But you're here and you say, Pastor, I need to get my heart right, or I'm, I'm going to come back tonight to the Lord. I'm going to make a fresh surrender. Raise your hand if you want prayer. Come on, right now. You'd, you'd respond right now. You'd lift your hand and say, that's me. I see that hand. Quickly. Others? Some others are here tonight. Backslider. Come on. This is your time. This is your opportunity to get some things squared away before you leave this place. Don't, don't just go home the way you came. You lift your hand quickly. Who else? Hold your hand so I can see it. All right, those of you that have raised your hand, you're over there. I see your brother in the orange or your T-shirt. Look at me. You mean that? I want you to come to the altar. Come on. This is a time to, to do business. Don't care about what others think. The only one you need to care about right now is Jesus. Come on, brother. You raise your hand. Come on down and find a place to pray. Come on and find a place to pray. We're going to shift gears. There's several. Three, I think, four have come. I mean, just kneel here and someone's going to pray with you. I want to believe God with you. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind, a wholesome mind, a mind that thinks well, a mind that's not all twisted like a pretzel with all kinds of neurotic, bizarre, flipped out stuff. Maybe you used and abused drugs. God helped me. When I was first saved, 19 years old, the healing balm of Jesus Christ healed my mind that was schizo. Let's stand. The altar space is open. You come find a place to pray. I believe that God wants to do business. We're going to pray a deliverance prayer, and I'm trusting that God is going to send some men home tonight with a real deliverance. Something is going to be demolished or dismantled a stronghold, an area that's been a springboard of oppression, any place in your mind that is full of, of, of fear or full of uh, despair, hopelessness, that is a 
clear indication of a stronghold. And we're going we're gonna, to uh, aim the gifts of the Spirit of God at that. Let's sing a chorus. You come, you talk to God. Maybe you're wrestling with sin. Name it. If it's lust, name it. If it's laziness, name it. Maybe it's rebellion, name it. And renew a right spirit within me. God, I'm asking you to work a miracle in the hearts and minds of men. Lay the axe to the roots. Every plant my Father you'd not planted shall be plucked up. We cast out. God, we, we cast out mountains, strongholds, God, that have harassed those fortifications that the devil has launched raiding parties from. God, we're asking for miracle deliverance in Jesus' name. Oh, by the power of the Holy Ghost, God. And renew a right spirit within me. All right, tonight I want to ask you to stand and we want to chop uh, some wood right now. We want to believe God. You have to make up your mind. Your mind is such a powerful weapon when it is harnessed. You're troubled, Jesus said. You're heavy. Come to me and yoke yourself with me. So there's something powerful of the impartation of Jesus. When Jesus is truly yoked with, when you are uh, surrendered to his lordship, his power begins to flow and uh, to help you. He said, if the son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. I don't, I'm not into this thing that, you know, that we have to pray every single time deliverance. Deliver. No, why don't we just smash some things right now? You know, in the Old, Te the Old Testament, they would smash those idols. Is there an idol? And I, anything you exalt above, anything the devil has manipulated you to exalt above Jesus. So if you're hearing fear, that's why I can't really surrender. That's why I can't really give. That's why I can't really uh, go on outreach. It's fear. That's an idol. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna smash some idols spiritually. Are you, are you into it? Can we do that tonight? I want you, okay. And, and if you've got this thing of lust, if you've got this thing of laziness, if you get, I, know, I don't believe in abracadabra, but I do believe that we judge things. The Bible said our weapons, not humans, not just willpower, it's Holy Ghost power. And something tangible is going to happen right now. And I want you to uh, make up your mind that you're going to, you no, know, I, don't, I don't want the guy next to me to get the mirror. I want him to have help. But you've got to have this uh, spirit that says, God, if you're going to help this guy over here and that guy over there, remember me too. I, I, don't pass me by, Jesus. I want my portion too. Will you have that spirit? Come on, can I hear an amen? amen. All right, you pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, amen. I heard the sermon. I'm responding to you wherever your hand has touched inside of me, my mind, my spirit, my heart. God, I acknowledge those areas that have been a hindrance and a blockade that have frustrated your spirit from having a free flow in my life. I renounce, I renounce all, sin, all sin, all rebellion, all rebellion every, act every act of witchcraft, of divination, every demonic uh, spirit that's associated with these strongholds. I renounce you. I give you no place. I command you in the name of Jesus, who is Lord of Lords, you must, you must obey. I cast you out. I lay the axe to the root. The blood of Jesus sets me free 
in my mind, in my heart, I am free by the blood of the Lamb. Let's praise God right now. Jesus. God, set the captive free. Lord, lay the axe to the root. We lose the power of the Holy Ghost. We lose God, your touch, your mighty hand, God. It is not short that you cannot save. Deliver men, God, in their heart of hearts, in their minds, in their souls, in their spirits, God. Oh, Son of God, Son of God, Son of God. Hallelujah. We accept that. God, we receive that. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Son of God, Son of God, I praise you. And hallelujah to the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. You can return to your seats. Thank God for that word. Amen. A word from God can save you and uh, alter the course of your life. Thank God. We appreciate Pastor Olson bringing that. I want to read to you a scripture before we receive the offering and uh, just want the ushers to come right now while I'm talking. 2 Samuel 17, 27 through 29, it came to pass that when David came to Maenaim that a uh, uh, number of men came, Barzillai, uh, the Gileadite brought beds, basins, earthen vessels, wheat, barley flour, parched corn, beans, lentils, parched pulse, butter, sheep, cheese for the people to eat. For they said the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. This is a story of David when he's on the run for his life. They had to suddenly flee out of Jerusalem. But the Bible tells about one of these men in particular, Barzillai. He was grateful for what David had done. David had been a king for a long time, had blessed his life, and now in a moment, he was his gratitude manifested in, I want to give a gift. I want to bless David and the men who have blessed us. And that is a Bible principle. The Bible says he brought to beds and basins and food supplies. This is a Bible principle that is important to God, is if someone has blessed you, number one, you should be grateful. You should want to say thank you. But number two, gratitude is not real if it does not involve finances. You, you didn't come like Barzalea with bar, beds and basins and sheep, but you came with an ability to give money. Pastor Olson has spoken to us uh, the word from heaven. Some of you, if you listen, you experienced a touch from heaven in the altar. If you live that out now, this can alter the course of your life. But what's interesting in the story of Barzillai is not just that he gave a gift, but what it triggered in his life. It caused the king to want to listen to his request. 2 Samuel 17, 37 
Now, whatever you ask of me, I will do for you. This is such an important principle to God that when we honor uh, a man of God who has blessed us through the preaching of the word, the ears of the king are attentive. And I want to tell you, this is an important principle. You need to learn liberality. Whenever you have an opportunity in a revival or in a men's discipleship, when you can return a blessing, that is something that our king pays attention to. So I'm going to encourage you, this offering tonight is a love offering. We're going to give 100% of it to uh, Pastor Olson. There are numbers of ways you see on the screen that you can give. If you're writing a check, make it out to the Potter's House and we will give him uh, one check. But there are other ways, electronic, you can text give you can go on the app secure give app you can go on our website numbers of different ways but you give let's bless pastor Olson and thank him for ministering the word of God to us I am um, you ask God's blessing on the offering amen amen let's sing that song I've been washed in the blood and I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Washed in the blood where the power began. Power of forgiveness, cleansing from sin. I've been washed in the blood, the blood of. I've been washed in the blood. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Washed in the blood where the power began. Power of forgiveness, cleansing from sin. I've been washed in the blood, the blood. Glory, glory, Lord. Glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. Glory, glory, Lord. You are the mighty God. You are the mind as we stand, sing glory, glory, Lord. Glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. Glory, glory, Lord. You are the mighty God. You are the mighty God. Praise the Lord together right now. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Praise God, we're going to be dismissed. You make sure you travel safe as you go home, and then the next time we're going to be meeting is Prescott Conference, July 8 through 12. Let's bow our heads, and uh, Pastor Delbert, John, you dismiss him in prayer. Amen. God bless you. You can be dismissed.